All right. Um, good evening. Thank you. We're, we're just going to launch in here. Um, I'll introduce David in a, in a minute. But thank you all for coming and almost filling up the room on this bad weather night. And, and the weather report scared a lot of people off and canceling schools and all of that. Uh, but you hardy souls made it, and thank you. As always, I, I want to start by thanking the staff at Kelly Writers House. They just do this all through the year. I participate and host a few of these, but Jessica Lowenthal uh, and her great staff, and, and, and the house, uh, the, the writing programs uh, led by Al Filries, who isn't here, but week in, week out, this entire staff is so dedicated to bringing tremendous cultural programs and always the written word first. And I just can't thank them enough and uh, the audiovisual people, everyone who, who contributes to make this a really special place, not just at the University of Pennsylvania, but I think in the country. Um, I'm so glad to see some old friends and faces, old some old colleagues from the English department, Dave Espy, his wife Molly. I'm seeing, I, I saw some old students. Um, I think Susie Cook has the record of being the longest tenured uh, O2. We worked together, that's 17 years ago. Uh, but Elaine is here down from New York 13 years ago, I think. Ben, a few years ago, graduated. And I just met some students that I'm going to teach for the first time in January. I, I sent out a blast email a couple days ago, and these students, whom I don't know, are enrolled for telling stories out of photographs. We're going to get this guy to tell a story out of a photograph here in just a little while. So you several who are here for that course, you'll already be a jump ahead. So such a hard time of year. You came out. Thank you very much. Um, I'll embarrass him, but Bill Marimo is here. He... Um, uh, a two-time Pulitzer winner, has had a half-century experience with the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, and that is ending now with former uh, editor-in-chief in the last couple years been doing a different thing. But in some ways, I want to hope to bring Bill a little bit into the conversation when we open it up to the audience, because that's always one of the best things we do when we, when we invite your questions. Um, members of David's family are here. Uh, his sister Jean and her husband came over from Pittsburgh. They weren't afraid of the weather. And I think maybe <laughs> I think maybe a cousin up from Wilmington and some some other family members. And not least Linda Marinus, who is David's spouse, goes with him on so many of these trips I, 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 and research trips. I half the time think that that um, the secret mystery to all these books is Linda Marinus. Her name's not on the cover, but that's part of how they get done, I think. Would you... Uh, Definitely a mystery. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, yes. Couldn't do it without uh, her. Well, couldn't do without <laughs> Linda. I couldn't do without my own spouse, Seal Hendrickson, who's here. But David himself, um, uh, a friend of 40 years, um, and no stranger here to Kelly Ryder's house. I think this is his fourth visit. It's very hard for me to speak of him objectively. It's his generosity of spirit, his native Midwestern decency. It also, I suppose, has something to do with his quiet awareness of how much he has achieved in his career. I would be here all night if I tried to do any real justice to it, but also the winner of two Pulitzers for his Washington Post journalism, and a finalist three other times for his nonfiction books. That's pretty amazing. And assorted other high journalism cum literary awards in America. But of the books, I guess I would describe them as deeply reported books about the American experience. Biographies of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, a book about the Vietnam War titled lyrically, They Marched into Sunlight. A modern dance ballet and a film documentary came out of that project. A book about Detroit, which is a kind of love letter to one of the gritty, 
places of his childhood. Again, so much conveyed in the poetic title, Once in a Great City. A handful of sports books that lift themselves up out of sports to become something else entirely. Evocations of time and place, I suppose. Deep studies of character, whether the great humanitarian Roberto Clemente of the Pittsburgh Pirates or the fiercely combative, if oddly tender, Vince Lombardi who coached the Green Bay Packers, David's live-or-die every fall (laughs) Sunday of his life NFL team, um, and they won yesterday. Um, That book um, about Vince Lombardi became a Broadway play. I once sat beside David at one of the performances on Broadway and kept stealing sidelong glances as he leaned forward as if in total wonder at his impossible luck. (laughs) And, and, and now this book, his 12th, his most beautiful and courageous yet, in my opinion, A Good American Family, The Red Scare, and My Father, a book he had no choice but to write at least great swaths of it in the first person, no matter how deeply reported it is. First person is not especially something David is comfortable with as a writer, but he did it here. At the center of this parable, if I can call it that, is an idealistic and flawed person like anyone on earth who, as a young man in college and for a long while after, too long after, one would have to say, was a member of the Communist Party who was proud, nonetheless, to command an all-black company in the Pacific in World War II, who came home and got spied on by the FBI, who got named by an informant, who got hauled up before HUAC, the House Un-American Activities Committee, having just been summarily fired from his Michigan newspaper job, and who, at that kangaroo HUAC hearing in 1952, was given no chance to try to explain himself or his motives, and who then, for the next five years, along with his wife and young children, the smallest of whom is sitting beside me, became a blacklisted and wandering American. It is, nonetheless, a redemptive story about one of the ugliest, most hysterical periods of our recent history. And why? Because the happy ending is that Elliot Marinus made his way all the way back, culminating, you might say, a good while after his death in this book itself, written by his son, who was too young to really understand any of it at the time. Of this book, with its quietly defiant, quietly declarative title, A Good American family. The New York Times said this past summer, quote, Marinus has used his prodigious research skills to produce a story that leaves one aching with its finely wrought sense of what was lost. It is at the same time a book that, like his family, never gives in to self-pity, but remains remarkably balanced forthright and unwavering in its search for the truth. Could we welcome David Marinus back to Writer's House? Thank you for that dramatic and meaningful introduction. (laughs) We can absolutely start this anywhere we want and and just just bat it around, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind for a moment turning around and 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 telling us about this good American family. First, when is this, David? I happen to know. This is in the winter of 1950. We're at 1402, as you can see on the sign, Henry Street in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the home of my grandparents, Andrew and Grace Cummins. And the entire... Cummins family is gathered on the front stoop, um, including three people who are in the room today. Um, 
This is my big sister, Jeannie, who's here. Um, <laughs> I don't want to embarrass Mary, but this is Mary. I don't know, I don't know what was bugging her, but <laughs> my cousin Mary. And I'm in the bonnet up on the upper left being held by my left-handed father, Elliot. So here's the center of the story. Here's David's dad. And Elliot. my mother is the radiant woman in the middle wearing the fur coat, Mary. And where's Grandmother Cummins? Grandmother Cummins is trying to call she's, Mary. She's trying to. <laughs> my grandfather, Andrew Adair Cummins, is, was an uh, engineer. Um, from, grew up in Kansas, and uh, three of the children in his family were named the best citizens of Evansville, Indiana at one point when they were in uh, elementary school, and all three of them grew up to become radicals. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so my, right here is my uncle Robert Cummins, who uh, is another major figure in the book. He, uh, after graduating from the University of Michigan, went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War. And that was sort of the ideological center of, of the family in many ways. Um, so, and it was, I mean, of course, I was too young to remember this, but it's an iconic photograph in our family. I think everybody, all of the 17 cousins know it by heart and where they were. Um, my cousin Tom is uh, about my age, we're very close. You can't see him because he's turning around. Uh, but I'm going up to, he runs a bookstore in Chatham, New York. I'm going there tomorrow. And at this point, this woman, Sue, who was married to Bob, who fought in the Spanish Civil War, you see her coughing. Within a year, she'd be dead of polio. And, and tell us about Phil. And Phil? Uncle Phil, standing next to my father. Be, so, so. Here's Elliot, yes. here's Phil, and here's David. Right. So Phil, Phil. Phil was home uh, for the holidays, probably, from a sanatorium in Asheville, North Carolina. He had already had a uh, lobotomy. Uh, that was what they did in those days. Um, and he lived uh, after this for many years with my grandparents, but he was still at the sanatorium at that point. Um, right here... My brother Jim, the oldest of the three of us, who was a professor at Amherst, and we could talk about him. We, we want to talk about Jim <laughs> Marinus here in a little while. Um, and so at this point, my father and my uncle Bob were being followed by the FBI everywhere they went. There were, in the end, 37 either FBI agents or informants who were tracing their every move. And when I got the FBI files, you could see that from starting in 1946 through 1957, long after my father was called before the committee and long after he had no involvement with the Communist Party, uh, the FBI, you know, they probably knew about this picture. Um, this is a good American family and, and and chapter 22 in the book is entitled, as the book itself, A Good American Family. And this picture is on the facing page. I looked at this picture and just fell in love with it. I mean, isn't this just a good American family in the Burns Park And I should say in every, I mean, you know, it was like every family had a lot of different types of characters in it. But there were no cheats in this family. There was no one who had ever been arrested except... My uncle broke the law by going to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Um, there was a lot of generosity in the family, um, starting with the way my grandparents, who had all of these children and in-laws who were getting in various forms of political trouble, they supported everybody in the family in w one way or another, and their, their home was the, the solid place where we could all go, no matter what else was going on in our lives. Um, and the 17 cousins, they're not all born yet, but eventually there were 17, um, have been remarkably close in sort of, if not physically, emotionally for all of this period. And every three years we have a family reunion still. It's been going on for, since 19, in the 1980s. To, um, to context this a little. And it is a good American family, I guess is the yeah. point. Yeah. 
Um, so David tells us in the book that this is early January, just a few days after the first of the year in 1950. So it's almost exactly two years in the future that his father, Elliot, will be called up and and having been summarily fired as soon as the word got out and, and called un-American. Um, but what I love is the universe. If, in, in the four walls of that rectangle, there are just so many amazing stories. David, um, so you tell us that this is just at the beginning of January 1950. The next month, it's, you know, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who is... Who is, who is the awful, iconic figure of the Red Scare? It's it's only in February. It's a month after this that what he he stands up and he says, at a speech in West Virginia, I have here in my hand. Yeah, in Wheeling, West Virginia, in February of 1950, uh, he didn't have any names in his hand, but he claimed he had two hundred the names of 205 communists in the federal government. I mean, those those words have yeah. sort of burned themselves into our cultural. I have here in my hand. Um, and, you know, here, here is this drama playing out. I was so taken by, by, by Phil. He's home. No, you don't know why he's in that picture. He, he, was on, he got some kind of home leave for the holidays from Yeah, from he being... came home now and then. And you, you can see that in letters that he wrote to my mother, that my mother wrote to him. Um, but, no, I have no clue why he was home then, except it was a holiday. Um, so this is the good American family. Um, I wonder if we, as long as we're looking at telling stories out of photographs, we can, um, Zach, put up, please, the, the other one of the family. It's, uh, here we go. Tell us about this photograph, David. Story, tell us this photograph. <laughs> this is... This is on the cover of the book. This is um, my nuclear family. I'm the little guy blinking into the sun in the shorts with Jeannie on one side and Jim on the other, and my dad's left arm draped around Jim. And this is in the summer of 1952, um, not long after, I mean, right after my father was fired from the Detroit Times, after he was called before the House on american Activities Committee, and it's another photograph that, you know, uh, my sister and I and Jim have known about forever. It's just sort of etched into our memories. Um, I don't remember that moment. My sister might. Um, but um, it's kind of perfect that we're at the Statue of Liberty after my father has been called un-American. And at this point in the story... Elliot Marinus uh, being called thought disloyal to his country and without a job. The family has become wanderers in America, and, and they have gone, at this point, gone east to live with not the Cummins side, not the maternal side of the family, but the paternal side of the family. And so they were, you were cramped into a space on... In, in Coney Island, New York, where my grandparents, the Marinuses, lived, uh, Joe and Ida, um, were kind of mutts. My father was, not, was a non-religious Jew from New York, and my mother was Scotch-Irish uh, Methodist from the Midwest. Um, and we lived with our Jewish grandparents in Coney Island, uh, I don't remember that, so I can't describe it vividly. Um, my sister remembers it better, um, but it definitely was a small, cramped space for three kids, and I can only imagine what it was like for my mother um, to deal with all of that. We only lived there for a few months. Um, it was the beginning of five years of wandering, and my sister and brother were enrolled in one of the PS88, was it, Jeannie? Yes, 188. 188. Um, briefly, um, and my father worked at one of the many New York newspapers that folded right after he got there, the New York Compass. Uh, he worked there for a few months, and then it folded, and we were on the road again. Um, but this was the start of the five years of wandering. And we can come back to, to the wandering in a minute, but... Aren't these just gorgeous photographs, American photographs of this family who got caught up? 
one of the things I love about this book is that you have a massive event in American history, the Red Scare. Well, we're trying to understand it through through the struggles of one American family. Actually, David says in the very opening of the book, um, the hearings in which his father had no chance to explain himself, David says, think of this story as a wheel. The hearing in room 40, 740, excuse me, room 740 is the hub where all the spokes connect. We're, this, is a, this is a beautiful story about one American family, but other characters come into the story, the, 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 the head person of the committee and the, the lawyer, and David can tell us about some of those. So the, it, that it's deeply reported that way, but at its most basic level, he tamps it down so we can, it's too big to say the Red Scare, what does that mean? But if you try to understand it, through the struggles of this one American family. And here they are, taking a little holiday with not much jangle in their pockets, I would think, because he's unemployed and living with his parents and uh, probably to just, to you know, it, was, it, it cost them something just to get, to get to the Statue of Liberty that day from Coney <laughs> Island. I, I don't know, but um, I never felt that we were broke. Um, maybe we were. I don't know. Zach, put up the uh, Imperfect S logo, and we'll have David go at this. I wonder if, thank you, um, David will be eloquent on this because he is so powerfully eloquent on this in the book. I'll let him well, take this, over. Um, so my father wanted to deliver a statement to the committee and the chairman of the committee, John Stevens Wood, basically said you can't do that unless you confess to your sins and seek absolution and name names, which my father refused to do. So they took the statement, but he wasn't allowed to read it. Um, when I, Even before I started researching this book, um, my family knew about the that incident because the transcript of the hearing where my father was called was a matter of public record, as are any congressional hearings. So we, when we'd read the transcript, you'd see my father saying, I'd like, I have a statement I'd like to read, and him being denied it. So I knew about it, but I never thought I would find it. And um, the first place I went in my research was the National Archives in Washington, DC. All of the House on American Activities Committee files had been opened. There was a huge box just for the Detroit hearings of February and March 1952. And in that box was a file that said Elliot Marinus. And I opened it, and the first thing I saw was statement of Elliot Marinus. Was your heart pounding? Yes. Um, there, nothing makes my heart, well, I should say, in my professional life, nothing makes my heart <laughs> pound louder and then when I find something that, that I know is what I call a gold mine in terms of uh, what I'm looking for, archive. So David, David is a gold standard researcher, and he's been in many, many, many archives. I know something about this myself. This folder was Series 3, Box 2, and here it is, entombed down at the National Archives, and the sun is now This is 2015. It. He, he wrote it in March 12, 1952, and no one had seen it, I'm sure, uh, until I looked at it. And as I write in the book, what really got to me was the S. The imperfect S, he be, calls it. Why? Be, Why? Why did be, that S get to because, you? Because um, I immediately could see my dad typing. He was a he was a violent hunt and peck typist who was constantly making mistakes and Xing them out, and the keys would stick. And sometimes on those old manual typewriters, they would jump a half space. And so when I saw the S that was jumped, for the first time in my life, 2015, I was 65 years old, and really for the first time, I could feel what it must have been like for my father at that moment, the most difficult moment of his life. Would you um, read us this paragraph, please? 
<laughs> it is. Don't be afraid to to read your beautiful prose. Oh come on, it's not. It is invariably thrilling to discover an illuminating document during the research process of writing a book. But in this case, that sensation was overtaken by pangs of a son's regret. Looking at the typed statement, I started to absorb finally what I had never fully allowed myself to feel before, the pain and disorientation of what my father had endured. For decades, I had desensitized myself to what it must have been like for him. I'd always considered him in the moment, rarely, rarely if ever relating present circumstances to the context of his past. As much as I loved him, I'd never tried to put myself in his place during those years when he was in the crucible, living through what must have been the most trying and transformative experience of his life, until I saw the imperfect S. Yeah, the imperfect S. The fact that it was standing up from the line just instant. Yeah, that's the, you know that's often the case that it's a, the smallest detail that has the yeah, most resonance, yeah, yes. and that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder, w w an old royal typewriter, maybe. <laughs> he had a royal um, and an Underwood at various points. I don't know which one that was. Yes. Um, uh, what did you do when you you <laughs> you found the statement? <laughs> well, you know, I, they let you copy it. I, I got a copy of it, yes. That um, day? Um, actually, I got two copies in two different ways. Yeah, that day, and also they sent a, sc a scanned copy of it to me. Um, and I just, kn you know, this was really the first thing I had for the book, and I knew I had the book. Did right, you go right out in the then. hall and call Linda and said, I have it, I got it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done that many times. And yes, uh, I don't think I called her, but I definitely was excited when I got home. And, you know, of course, the imperfect S is, it was emotional for me, and it had a very, it sort of powered me through the whole book, but, but it's the statement itself that, that has lasting meaning. And, and the, the statement is reproduced in full in the book. David builds up to the statement. The statement it's only a couple of pages long, is its own chapter. And by the time we get to it in the book, we're more than ready um, to read the statement of this man. I'm so taken by what I had never fully allowed myself to feel before, the pain and disorientation of what my father had endured. You had, you had kept it emotionally from you. Well, I think the whole family had in various ways. And... Um, you know, by the time I was conscious, my father had survived, moved on, uh, had a very successful career as a newspaper uh, reporter and editor at the Madison Capital Times, which we can get to later. Yeah. But so that's the that's the Elliot Marinus that I knew, and of course I knew that he had been that there had been a difficult point in his life. Um, I knew that he'd been blacklisted. I knew that he hated, you know, Joe McCarthy and Richard Nixon and various other figures of that period. You say you knew this. You you grew into a kind of, in the way all families have secrets, that you kind of grew into a vague awareness of this without it being directly talked about. Um, you would, yes. I mean, for me, I mean, I think he he didn't talk about it much at all. He didn't he didn't like talking about it. Um, my mother, but they, they would talk around it. I mean, they'd certainly yes, talk yes, about the yes. period and about their distaste for the McCarthyism of that era. Um, and we knew what it, something had happened to my dad and that he'd been fired and that we bounced around for a long time. But, but it, it, was, it was really not, we were a classic family of the 1950s and 60s. There were other things <laughs> going on by 57 when we got to Madison and it wasn't, you know, very rarely would it come up. I remember one time, this is not in the book, but um, I had a fifth and sixth grade teacher at Randall School in Madison who was a real right-wing jerk. And he knew that my dad was at the Capitol Times, and every week or so he would go on this rant about the communist Capitol Times. 
And I remember coming home from school one day, crying and telling my mother, and her storming out of the house and marching up to Randall's school to tell this guy off. So, you know, it was, it was kind of that sort of thing, but not anything direct about what happened to us. So, um, just once again to context this, when, when all of this happened, when the hearings took place, David is not yet three. He's two and how many months? Um, well, almost three. So he hasn't, he like, hasn't come yeah, to yeah, any yeah. kind of consciousness. This is maybe the place in the discussion tonight to enter David's older brother, Jim Marinus, <laughs> uh, important figure in this story. He's five years older than David and extremely precocious. Ends up going to Harvard, er, to Harvard and a PhD at Princeton, becomes a renowned um, scholar of Spanish literature. Um, little side note, he too won a Pulitzer Prize. For what, David? For writing uh, the uh, libretto of an opera. There, uh, <laughs> Life is a dream. The number, the number of brother duo Pulitzer Prize winners in America, you can put them on about three thumbnails. Uh, so the Marinus fan. David's but older But the truth is my sister's the smartest one in our family. Oh, Gene, well, we've we got to bring you in here shortly. I'm, I've got my eye on the clock. She won't um, want to be brought in. Um, She's tough. So um, David is... is not three, when, when the worst moment of this is happening. Jim, the precocious seven-year-old, is, is aware in a much, much deeper way than his kid brother. So then skip forward a lot of decades, and David Marinus wants to open this musty trunk and write the truth and write a loving story. Um, my brother Jim once explained about that earlier period was, quote, was like another life, one that didn't belong to him anymore at all, just a folly, and it was a dead letter to him and should stay dead. I was um, honored to read this book in Bound Galleys more than a year ago, and I remember, this is just on page six, and I talked to David about this, in emails at least, maybe, maybe we had a conversation too. I was so taken by this on the page. Can I explain? I'm reading the Bound Galleys, and his big brother is telling him when, when David is going to write a book about this. It, it, it's like another life, one that didn't belong to him anymore at all, just a folly, and it was a dead letter to him, comma, and should stay dead. When I'm reading the Bound Galleys, I was absolutely certain what the next sentence would be, the next, which starts a new paragraph. I was absolutely certain that the next sentence would be, but I respectfully disagree. But that's not the next sentence. David, I talked about at the opening here, his fundamental decency and generosity of spirit, which is uh, a rare quality in, in journalism, I feel, because journalism can, can eat people up and can make you ultra competitive. David is the opposite of all this. He let that quote from his brother hang for what it was, and let the reader take it in. I mean, the book itself obviously becomes an implicit and an explicit rebuke of those words. But rather than David saying, I respectfully disagree, he just let his brother, in a sense, have the word, have the jury, and maybe allow readers out there to say, it was a dead letter to him, comma, and should stay dead. The next paragraph in the ne next sentence goes into his father's biography. He was born in Boston in 1918, and most of his childhood, etc. And, and I have to think that that was, 
so generously deliberative on your part that you let Jim have that word in the ju- in, in front of the the jury box and you didn't contradict him except that the book contradicts it uh, talk well, about Jim well um, my brother uh, is somewhat intimidating with his brilliance and I've always been a little bit um, intimidated by him but I love him and I disagree with him a lot, uh, you know, not about anything important, but about sort of emotional things, um, or not about anything political or, or, you know, about books or movies or anything like that. But so he, he was very important to this book because he pushed me. And we have slightly different interpretations of how he pushed me but i have the emails to so i know what he, what happened you mean he's, he pushes you after you've undertaken it or pushing you before it begins well before and a little bit while it was going on um so but what he basically did was say you know what can you add to the story yeah yeah, and you're too young. You were yeah. a little. Yeah, what did you know? You knew nothing. And how could you ever know what our parents were really thinking? And I knew something. I was seven years old, but I'm not going to write the book. What the? Who the hell are you? He didn't say that. He, <laughs> he didn't. But, he might have meant it. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that he felt that it was his story more than mine, and I, in some ways it was. But he wasn't going to write it. Um, and so it was really important for me that he pushed me. Because it made me step back and say, well, why am I writing this book? Would it hurt my father? I'm not going to back away from any truths in it. What if I'd found out when the FBI reports came in that my father was an informant? I didn't even know if that was possible. You know, anything's possible. So um, I was, my, I had to say, well, why am I doing this book? And I realized that it wasn't just to honor my father, which ended up being part of what happened. But it was because I wanted to, you know, I'd spent my whole career studying other fam- you know, figures from Clinton and Obama to Lombardi and Clemente. And I knew more about their families than they knew about them. But I didn't really know the story of my own family in any real detail. And just, willing to, to take it where, it where it led you. So I... I Basically, I had to do it. I mean, I knew I had to do it, but my but I thought it was valuable that uh, my brother pushed me. My sister was very good at sort of mediating between the two of us. And so, Gene, where were you? Speak up, Gene. Where were you on this? And when David came and said, I think I want to do this book. Well, I don't want to. Um, I think I always sort of knew that David would write a book. Right. Um, my mother was a little bit more willing to talk. A little more willing to talk about it. And so when my father died, what he left was, was a, not a promise exactly, but he clearly didn't want it to be mentioned at his funeral or anything like that. So I think I knew that Dave wanted to tell this story and he'd be a great person to do it. And to find out a lot of things that we didn't know the details of, there's not no way you can find everything out. There's a lot that still remains a mystery about what they were thinking and doing, and that's probably true of any story. Of course. <laughs> but so I wasn't surprised when he said he wanted to write the book. My husband and I were a little concerned about whether Dave what would be willing to write about things that he found out that were. You know that he'd ha- if he was going to write the book, it had to be an honest book. So that was the only concern that we had. And so I feel that a writer, if they want to write a book, it's their book. Were you nervous through the writing no, process? No, no, I wasn't nervous at all. Because you trusted your baby brother. No, because I trusted. <laughs> no, because I didn't really think there would be anything sh- shocking or horrifying in it. Um, but yeah, no, he did a great job, and I learned some things. Some of it I already knew, but. 
So we both Jim and I, you know, we he consulted with us and we read the manuscript. I know, I know. Made that. a few co- suggestions. He brought. He really brought you into the process. He really did. And reading the manuscript was a, a, a terribly emotionally experience for me, and I know it was for Dave too, um, because it's all so personal, you know. Once you crossed, that was beautiful. I heard some. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're 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 talking about this in some ways kind of clinically. This is so <laughs> deeply emotional, isn't it? Family secrets and spoken and unspoken pressures and not your your father and mother not necessarily wanting to talk about it much, but when remarks would slip out about that period, they you you know what what they thought, and and for you to be able to cut through this. A writer has to be able to write what he has to be able to to do. I'm suddenly thinking of our younger son, a 31-year-old journalist for The Atlantic, who's had a lifelong stuttering problem, and, and 10 days ago, he wrote about Joe Biden's stutter and his own. And um, we were all just on tenterhooks as a family, but that story had to be written. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe Biden and me, uh, and it was a small nuclear explosion in America uh, when it when it came out. Um, Let me uh, add one uh, thing off for the all. subject, way way off the no, subject. No, well, it's on the subject. I wanted to say that that of all the books I've written, this book had the most fascinating uh, reaction from readers that I've had, uh, the most emotional reaction, the most people who've written to say that their family endured something like this, or just that their family had a secret um, that they hadn't really confronted, and thanking me for doing this in various ways and illuminating their their lives, even though it's about my family. Um, I, w- I didn't know that that would happen, but um, aside from my book on Vietnam, which had a similar response from veterans, this one has had the most the most emotional and meaningful response, reaction. And David, there are things, I mean, Gene was just saying this, that, and, and it's, it's all through the book, that you don't know the answers to. What, what, why did your dad stay in the communist sensibility for so long? Well, some people stayed longer. I mean, he, you know, from 1952 on, after he was called before the committee, the FBI for five more years follows him, and every FBI report says we have no indications of any activity involving the Communist Party. Um, you know, some people left in 1939. Why, why would he stay past 1939? Um, because he still wanted to believe, and... There were rational. So my father in 1939 was the editorial editor of the Michigan Daily, which was a big job. And the Michigan Daily was a fabulous college newspaper in that period, really sophisticated, probably one of the, I would consider one of the 10 best newspapers of any sort in the country then. Uh, Arthur Miller wrote for it, um, uh, John Charity, all of these literary uh, people, and a lot of great. essays about everything ranging from the Tennessee Valley Authority to uh, what was going on in Europe uh, to uh, literary essays about uh, Richard Wright and and Thomas Wolfe. It was was a pretty amazing newspaper. My father was the editorial editor. And then that part of the 1930s, I would sort of compare to the 1960s in terms of the radicalization of a lot of smart young people on college campuses. And in that period, um, they were all moved toward the Communist Party as opposed to SDS or whatever it was in the 60s. Um, so Stalin makes a pact with Hitler, the, the, uh, the Soviet Nazi pact. Some people left the party because of that, and some bought into Stalin's rationalization, which was essentially that he was just protecting himself from the eventual invasion that he knew Hitler had coming. Um, you know, so reading my dad's editorials during that period and also uh, in the same era, the Soviets invaded Finland, another inexcusable uh, act of aggression. Um, so my father is, is rationalizing both of those uh, 
And I'm shaking my head as I'm reading the editorials. They're really well written, but you know, I disagree with them pretty profoundly. Um, and I think that that you know, it's a it's a common human trait that people believe what they want to believe until something really dramatic shakes them out of it. And that wasn't enough at that point. We've got to get some questions for the audience, but just very, very quickly, because we don't want to leave this base untouched. The, um, the happy ending of the story, I say, and, and David will talk about it. Elliot Marinus does make his way all the way back. They wander in America for five years. He he gets fired from other jobs. The FBI follows him, and boom, he's out again, or papers fold. For five years, they are in exile. They're, they're in the desert. But then... Somebody takes a chance, and he ends up in Madison, Wisconsin. Tell us about that. And he ends up with such a great career. Well, before that, we moved back to Ann Arbor after the paper, Coney Island folded, lived with my grandparents there. Then my father got a job at the Cleveland Plain Dealer because a friend of his from the Michigan Daily worked there and got him a job there, which lasted until the... And we loved Cleveland. It was kind of, I remember, you know, the Cleveland Indians won the pennant that year we were there. It was my first baseball team. Bob Feller. Well, yeah, but I mean, I loved uh, Larry Doby and Bobby Avila. Um, and went to the airport to get their autographs after they clinched the pennant. But then the FBI came to, Cle to the Pelling dealer and said, you hired a former communist, and he was fired. He's gone. Went back to Detroit, spent a couple of... Pretty formative years back in Detroit, the one the years I remember most vividly that inspired me to write the book about Detroit. And my father was out of newspapers and he had a job selling party favors for labor unions, uh, which I can't imagine him doing. But then finally there was a strike newspaper in the Quint Cities of Iowa. Uh, the the printers, the I International Typographical Union, went on strike against the papers in that area, Rock Island, Moline, East Moline, Davenport, Bettendorf. And they put out a paper called Labor's Daily. And my father was hired to be the editor of the local edition of Labor's Daily. Um, and it was, a, you know, a, it was a group of people who'd been bounced around for various political reasons who came there to run this paper or work on the paper. And my father was in his element again. He was a really wonderful newspaper person. He loved every part of newspapers. He knew how to read type upside down. He loved going to the back shop. He loved writing headlines, editing. Uh, I've often told the story of my favorite headline he ever wrote was when Bing Crosby died uh, playing golf on a golf course in Spain. And Dad's headline was, Bing goes at 74, two over par, uh, <laughs> which was true in every possible sense. It was two over par for the course and two over the average age of a male in that era. Um, so anyway, he, he was back in his element, but this was a paper that was, Labor's Daily was doomed from the beginning. It didn't have enough money. The ITU wasn't going to support it anymore. But every few weeks... Uh, they would run a column called Hello, Wisconsin, written by the founder and publisher of the Madison Capital Times, William T. Evu, who was an old uh, buddy of Robert La Follette's. And, and it was the progressive tradition, a paper that had taken on McCarthy from the beginning. Joe McCarthy was from Wisconsin. And so as the story goes, Evu said, who's putting out this paper? He, you know, he saw it because it ran his column. It's better than ours. It looks really good and found out it was Elliot Marinus, and the strike paper folded, and in the summer of 1957, we moved to Madison. Um, Joe McCarthy had just died. You know, he's not really in my book no. except as a shadow right. because he was in the Senate, and this is the House on American Activities Committee, but he was sort of the symbol of that era. He had just died. Um, we got a house near the Vilas Park Zoo, and I remember my first thought was, I don't want to get eaten by a lion or tiger. And the Milwaukee Braves were on their way to winning the World Series. And really from that moment on, I mean, Madison saved our family. 
the wanderers found a home. Yeah. And so he, he starts at this paper, the Madison Capital Times, and and he eventually becomes the the top man and, and hires a whole generation of newspaper people whom I've gotten to meet um, through a book that I have written about mm-hmm. Frank Lloyd Wright, and they say to me, wow, yeah, Elliot Marianus hired me. He became, in his own way, a kind of iconic figure in Wisconsin journalism in the in the what late part of the in the 60s 70s into he retired in 1982 and yeah he was I mean uh, everything I know about journalism I learned from my dad um, and uh, he was he had a, a energy a love of the story that just radiated and so if you were in the newsroom and he was there you just wanted to do it, you know, and that's what a great editors do. He had that mm-hmm. skill. And one of the wonderful things that happened after this book is just a couple of weeks ago, he was elected into the Wisconsin Newspaper Hall of Fame, which meant a lot to our so family. So this is the story coming all the way around. Um, I said Bill Marimo is here tonight, who, uh, although he, he went to Baltimore and ran the Baltimore Sun for 11 years, he's had about a half century experience with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Bill, this is this will sound like, you know, the oceanic question, but everything we're talking about here, this unfairness and people being accused without being able to talk for themselves. I was at dinner with Bill and his wife last Sunday, my wife and I, and and we got to talking and we I said to Bill the the term fake news, where where did that did that start in the Trump administration and Bill said, you know, Paul, I don't really know. But Bill, could such a thing as this happen again or is it, in a sense, is it already happening? In- well, Paul, um, I'm not a great predictor. I'm a better <laughs> analyst once things happen. But I think that, um, I think that um, one of the um, great redeeming features of this era is that um, news organizations with expertise and integrity are calling it as they see them. A lot of times when public officials lied, when I was a reporter, I would say, I would write something like, in an apparent contradiction of previous public statements. Uh Um, (laughs) Now now, you don't have to do that. Now the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, they're calling it what it is, a lie, or, or, or distortion. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is um, keeping the public informed. What's, what's repugnant to me is the polarization. Yeah. Democracy doesn't work. So what about all the people who don't, yeah, you, you, the reporter's able to say it's a lie, but the people who, that it just bounces off of? Uh, I am at a loss for the, the public reaction to all of this. I mean, to me, um, what's, what's um, redeeming is the news organizations that are showing integrity and honesty in their analysis. And um, I'm a great admirer of David's books. I thought this was really a classic. Thank you. And what happened to the family, to me, was repugnant. And um, it's important that the uh, media stand up and be counted. Um, we all ought to revere the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. Can, does somebody else have a question in the audience that we can address? To, yes, here, we'll, we'll get the microphone here in the front. I just have a question sort of picking up on Paul's comment, and that is, is there any indication that now there's something like an enemies list like Nixon had, like McCarthy certainly had? Well, sure, but it's public. Yeah. Um, yes, <laughs> we're the enemies of the people, right? Yeah. And that's not a joke. He means it um, as much as he means anything. Um, so, but, you know, the, where did this start? I mean, I, I think that the godfather of Donald Trump is Newt Gingrich, who I studied pretty heavily. And, 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 I, um, and I think that the parallels to the McCarthy era more than fake news are are the demonization of others of the uh, other of the other and the use of fear as a manipulative political tool that's what i was two. really getting yeah, to yeah. the use of fear and the demonization 
Because I, the parallels to me seem striking. And then even today you had uh, Giuliani, of all people, um, saying that the, the Democratic tactics were McCarthy-like. I mean, everything is completely upside down. And that one really pisses me off when the right-wingers um, say that they're being you know, uh, victims of McCarthyism when they're the perpetrators of it. Cecilia, uh, let's get the microphone here. There's the smartest person in our family. Uh, I have a curiosity about your own children's reaction to these stories of their grandfather, um, Sarah and Andrew. Yeah, Sarah and Andrew and the cousins. Um, you know, in some ways it's a generational thing that my generation, our generation, the post-war baby boom generation – was so defined in our early years by the fear of communism and, and air raid drills and all of that, that it had a, it had a, a scarier uh, connotation than it does to my children or to my nephews and nieces. And so it wasn't like they were embarrassed at all. Um, and, you know, they, uh, my, my dad was uh, incredibly generous and warm to all of his grandchildren so they've naturally that's the father, the grandfather they know anyway or knew um, but but the, the that part about his past um, it, it didn't phase them at all and you know my son Andrew is also a writer and was very close to Elliot my dad um, they bonded over baseball and the Packers um, but also Andrew is very much committed to racial justice. And so, you know, he has the picture of my father. My father was the commander of an all-black unit in World War II, um, which is another important part of the book. And, you know, that photograph of that whole troop is on my son's wall. And he writes a lot about racial justice in his own books. And, he, you know, that's the way he connects to my, my dad, to his grandfather. And so... Um, and my daughter the same way. So I don't, it was interesting. I was a little bit nervous about, you know, how, like, the in-laws or parents of in-laws might react to this story, which, but it's, it's all been, um, there's been no, uh, no embarrassment. No recrimination. No recrimination, nothing, no. We, yes, sir, we, I knew we had a bunch of questions. And my cousins, I should add, since my cousin Mary is here, who was very, she had one of the great archives. Her f mother, who was the youngest of the five Cummins children. Zach, can you go back to the Good American Family? Um, Not that one. The, no, the, 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 the first one. Yeah. So. Um, right, let's, let's. <clears throat> this is Aunt Jean, uh, the youngest of the of the Cummins kids. And she had six children, and Mary is one of them. And, and Aunt Jean was the most organized person I've ever met and had every letter and everything that anybody had ever written that came into any sort of realm of hers. And so another archive was, when Aunt Jean died, was Mary's, uh, a room at Mary's house, which had, uh, among other things, uh, all the letters that my mother had written to her brother, who was in the sanatorium, and several other documents. I'm feeling terrible here that we're not. There's just so much to talk about, and we will run out of time very shortly. Oh. <laughs> but but Dave, David's mom. I mean, Elliot Marinus is at the center of the story. My my the Red Scare and my father. But his mom is a huge part of this story. She too was in the party, and and um, as in so many American families, she was the. She's kind of the anchor of it all. But Mary, you had a question? Uh, I have. I have oh, oh, someone else. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, thank you for your, your work. I read two of your books. And, thank you. and thanks for having the event here tonight. Uh, um, uh, people, when they think of the McCarthy scare, I think is a, a dark chapter in the history. But, 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 um, at the same time as this was happening, um, there was Jim Crow segregation. Yes. Uh, 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 black people didn't have citizenship rights. Uh, in Puerto Rico, the repression against the uh, 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 Puerto Rican nationalists was much worse than, than it is. Uh, uh, uh. So, so you had that going on. And today, 
um, you have millions of people who are being deported. You, you, you have uh, more people in prison in this country than in any other country in the world, and there's 37 million people that don't have food to eat. So in some ways, uh, uh, while they say that this is a dark chapter, in some ways we can say that it's worse today uh, 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 than, than, it, than it was then. Uh, 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 um, so, so, so my question is, given what you know about the history and everything else, what, what, what's your overall opinion of, of, of the uh, uh, country? Uh, 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 don't, don't be bashful, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, isn't that a legitimate question? Just answer question? the universe yeah. question there. Uh, I'll, I'll answer it obliquely. Um, you know, my father, you know, a lot of families were destroyed in that period. We were lucky that we just were disrupted for a while because some families really never recovered from it, hundreds of them, if not thousands. Um, and, of course, the racism that you talk about was one of the major motivating factors of my parents' political lives. Um, my father's uh, lawyer was a civil liberties African-American lawyer, George Crockett, who became a congressman. And and was not a communist himself. He was a radical, but he believed that the impression of of communists was was another variation of what was happening to African Americans. And that he said, "Freedom is everybody's business." Um, my father emerged from all that as an optimist, and he and I inherited that optimism from him, um, for better or worse. Um, but. But um, I know, I mean, the American history is myth, myth, you know, it's a myth. I mean, the, the, the history that you're taught in schools is a myth. And, and it's the job of, of good historians to try to write the truth. And, you know, from, from the beginnings through the Civil War, Reconstruction, another horrible period of American history that really still uh, resonates today, um, you know, th through the Red Scare and the 60s and, you know, so, I mean, at every, at every juncture in American history, there, I'd like to think that it's, that it's an ascent, but it's not. It's, it's uneven. And um, I, my feelings today are that the short term is really iffy, but I feel better about the long term, honestly. I think if we get th if we survive this, Let, mean, let's let's have two more questions at the most. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Elaine, my my great old student Elaine <coughs> Wangling Yang, Elaine. So my question is, um, as you were doing the reporting for the yeah. book, whether it was manuscripts or photographs or interviewing sources, was there a moment that you came across, whether it be bittersweet or maybe something surprising or even contradictory that didn't make it into the final work that you'd be willing to share? Ah. That didn't make it in. <laughs> that didn't make it in. Um, I don't think so, honestly. I mean, I think anything that was surprising or important I put in the book. There's a lot of material I got that I didn't write about, but it, but it wasn't relevant to this story. Um, I thought you were going to ask it in a different way. I, I could tell you what the most surprising thing to me in the book was, and it's not that big, but it, but it was the most difficult moment for me. Um, when I f got the Freedom of Information, well, the FBI files for my dad, they came in two batches. One came a year after I filed it, and one came two years after it. The first uh, batch, there was an empty page that just said military intelligence investigation. There was nothing. And then a year later, I got the military intelligence investigation. When my father wanted to be an officer in the Army in World War II, um, they did an investigation of him and went back to the Michigan and Detroit and the places he'd been and interviewed 20 people. And one of the people they interviewed was a journalist who was, had my father's old job as the editorial editor of the Michigan Daily. This was three years later. And his name was Morton Mintz. Mm. And I knew Morton Mintz really well. I was his editor at the Washington Post for a while. He was, you know, much, much older than me, but he was a, 
a very uh, cantankerous, wonderful investigative reporter who did very important work and drove everybody crazy. But I liked him. And they interviewed Morton Mintz, and he told the military intelligence investigators, I would never let Elliot Marinus be an officer. Um, he follows the Stalinist line. Um, he, you know, he's not to be trusted. All of the, you know, really dumping on my father. And it was really difficult for me to read that yeah. piece of paper. And um, and did you you talked to Mort Mintz about and it? And so you? I well, first I was in Madison for the summer when I got that batch of documents. So I emailed him and said, you know, Mort, um, I have a very difficult uh, topic to talk to you about, but I know that you respect the truth and and you've dealt with a lot of difficult subjects. And then I attached his statement and you know. And he wrote me back the next morning and said this was the biggest shame of his life. And, and that really bothered me because he was 95 years old. Yeah, So he was much, much older than us at the Washington yeah, Post, yeah. And, and, and David worked with him intimately, but I, I knew him pretty well. And he was a figure of uh, yeah cantankerousness, but he was, I mean, his search for the truth, he drove everybody oh, crazy. Yeah, yeah. And... F- for him to, you told me this story a year or two ago. For him to say it was the biggest shame of his life. Wow. It was, well, he, I wonder if, in some sense, though, he was liberated finally to be able to say to you it was the biggest shame I of my don't, life. I don't know. I really don't because he couldn't remember the details of it. He, you know, he remembered that it happened, um, but he was 95. I was amazed that he was still alive, first of all. And then that he, um, and so I wrote him back and said, I don't want you to feel that way. My father was a very forgiving man. It was a very difficult time. And, and you know, I have no hard feelings for you. I'm just interested in this story and how and why you did it. And then I went to visit him in, when I got back to Washington um, and spent a few hours with him to go over it again. And again, he was very uh, uh, rueful about it. And uh, um, I kept saying, please, Mort, I don't want you to feel badly about this. You know, it's... You know, you were young. My dad was young. Things happen, um, and uh, but that was the most. Uh, you know, there were editorials my father wrote that I shook my head and said, "What were you thinking, Dad?" Um, some of the F- most of the FBI files were actually pretty prosaic. You know, just he went here. This was his license plate. This is what they're doing. You know, you know, for for eleven years of that. Um, but that one, uh, that one report of Mort Mintz is what really got me. It's, um, we, we should stop here. It seems to me this is a good place to stop. I was thinking one or two more questions, but we're past our regular time anyway. But this note that was just seeping through, David said, oh, it, it, Mort, my father was always a very forgiving person. It was such a difficult time. I think he would, he would have ultimately understood if not agreed and I mean this is what David is about too his character of forgiveness and decency and grace which is why these 12 books that are going to stand at some test of time would you thank David Marinus well, for being well, here would anybody stay for a few more minutes to listen to something by all okay. means because I want to read statement of Elliot Marinus yeah. all right this is a somewhat Uh, abridged version, but it's basically it. Statement of Elliot Marinus. I was taught as a child and in school that the highest responsibility of citizenship is to defend the principles of the U.S. Constitution and to do my part in securing for the American people the blessings of peace, economic well-being, and freedom. I have tried to do that to the very best of my ability. And for doing just that and nothing more, I have been summarily discharged from my job I've been blacklisted in the newspaper business after 12 years in which my competence and objectivity have never once been questioned. I must sell my home, uproot my family, and upset the tranquility and security of my three small children in the happy formative years of their childhood. But I would rather have that my children miss a meal or two now than have them grow up in the gruesome, fear-ridden future for America projected by members of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. I don't like to talk about these things, but my Americanism has been questioned. And to properly measure a man's Americanism, you must know the whole pattern of a life. The US Constitution and its Bill of Rights are not simply musty documents in a library. 
They have meaning only if they are used. To betray and subvert the Bill of Rights is the most un-American act any mayor, any man or committee can do. For that document was brought into being and maintained throughout our history by men who gave their lives and blood. Every newspaper man knows that history is not a printed page. It's the passion and striving, the struggling and endurance of men and women. These qualities that went into the making of our nation can be discarded only at great peril to ourselves and our children. From the time of Peter Zenger, the colonial printer who defied the British Crown's effort to impose censorship in the American colonies, right down to the present, newspaper men have zealously defended freedom of the press. For the First Amendment is not only a guarantee of free speech and a free press, it's also an indispensable part of self-government. That's what makes this committee so dangerous. Ostensibly designed to protect the government against overthrow by force and violence, it proceeds by force, terror, and threats to overthrow the rights of the American, committee, of the American people. This committee reflects no credit on American institutions or ideas. Its attempt to enforce conformity of political or economic thought is a long step toward dictatorship that holds the greatest danger to the American people. In this country, we have never acquiesced to the proposition that people could be punished for their beliefs. Statement of Elliot Marinus. Amen. Um, David's, David's book is available for sale, and if anyone wants to purchase it in the back, he'd be glad to sign a few copies. And also... So it's Paul's book. <laughs> uh, so a month and a half ago, two months ago, I was David's... David, we did this in reverse at the Wisconsin Book Festival. David um, interviewed me uh, for a book I've written about Frank Lloyd Wright. It was my thrill to have him back here tonight. So I think four times, you got to come back for a fifth. Get, get working on the next book. Uh, we have a little... Um, reception in the back too so stay around thank, thank you. you very much